My research on a photographic collection of the first Jewish museum in Berlin crosses cities, countries, and languages. I was first introduced to the collection at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw by the institution's former director, Professor Pavel Spiewak, to whom I owe my deep gratitude. The collection, among other objects, was discovered in 1951 by a group of researchers in a catacomb of a lower Silesian town. Recognizing the collection's Jewish context, they handed it over to the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw that was established soon after the Second World War with the mission to collect and preserve Jewish archives, artworks, and memorabilia that survived the war. Although the majority of the collection exists in Warsaw, the Neue Synagogue Zentrum Judaicum in Berlin, and particularly Dr. Hermann Simon and Dr. Hannah Schutz, conducted an extensive research on the history of the first Jewish museum in Berlin, which was located right next to Um, right next to the current location of the Centrum Judaicum in Berlin Mitte district. Dr. Simon and Dr. Schutz published their re research on the chronicles of the museum in several books and exhibitions. I was very lucky to spend the summer of 2019 at the Centrum Judaicum in Berlin and learn from them in person about the museum and its collection. I will begin my talk with a very brief introduction to the first Jewish museum in Berlin and continue with presenting a fragment from my research that is focused on the pedagogical aspect of the photographic collection designed by the museum's first director and chief curator, Dr. Karl Schwartz. I will then juxtapose Schwartz's thoughts on art education in the era of mechanical reproduction with the work of three Jewish scholars who were active in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century right before, as well as during, the establishment of the photographic collection, Martin Buber, Walter Benjamin, and Abby Warburg. I will conclude my talk with presenting the relevance of the collection for today's visual culture in the Jewish context and beyond. The Berlin Jewish Museum was officially inaugurated on the 24th of January, 1933. Its location was in Berlin's Mitte district, right next to the new synagogue in a building of a former Jewish nursing home on Uranenburger Strasse. The establishment of the museum um, was an indirect response to social and cultural processes of modernization, which were European Jews experienced since the beginning of the 20th century. The initial premise of the museum was to shape Berlin's Jewish cultural life and to bring modern Jewish art into the public discourse. However, only a week after the museum official opening, Hitler was appointed chancellor and the museum instead became a place for, of refuge for persecuted Jewish communities across Germany. Although it did not belong to any political movement and did not organize direct political activities, the museum's short existence between 1933 and 1938 could be understood in retrospective as a political action. Operating in the most difficult period for Jewish community for the Jewish community in Germany, the museum was striving to establish one of the largest repositories of European Jewish art from the late 17th century to the early days of modernism. In fact, the collection was established in 1917, 16 years before the museum was opened under the title Kunstsammlung der Jüdischen Gemeinde Berlin, the art collection of the Jewish community in Berlin. Its custodian was Moritz Stern, the chief librarian of the Jewish community. Yet it was not until 1927 when art historian Karl Schwartz became the curator of the collection and turned it into an extensive entity, which served as the foundation for the future museum collection. Apart from religious objects, painting and sculptures by modern Jewish artists that were donated or acquired into the collection, Schwartz was working on creating a photographic collection that was, would as well become a part of the future museum's collection. He gathered and commissioned photographs of both historical and contemporary Jewish public figures, synagogues and tombstones around Central Eastern Europe, as well as documentation from various Zionist Congresses that took place in Europe around the same years. Schwartz invited Jewish artists to contribute to the collection with photographic or graphic reproductions of their works. These material had later formed the pivot of the Berlin Jewish Museum photographic collection. Schwartz, who became the director and chief curator of the museum when it was opened in 1933, had an innovative approach regarding the museum's collection and display, as well as its educational program. 
the photographic collection that he cultivated gained a particularly important role after January 1933, when the whole modern art movement was under attack by the Nazi regime. As long as the museum was still operating, the collection functioned as a traveling exhibition, was used for research, presentations, and lectures about modern Jewish art and culture across Germany as a counteract for the Nazi propaganda. Several months after the opening of the museum, Karl Schwartz left Berlin and immigrated to Palestine to become the director and of the newly opened Tel Aviv Museum in Berlin. He was succeeded by Ernest Stein, who continued Schwartz's ongoing work on the collection. However, in 1935, she also immigrated to Palestine and was succeeded by Franz Landsberger, who was le the last director of the museum before the institution was forced to close down in 1938 after the Kristallnacht. The three directors of the museum, joined by a team of art historians and curators working at the institution, were derived by the premise of historical education. They wished to cultivate a past through placing artistic, cultural, and religious traditions in an explicitly comprehensive repository. Dr. Karl Schwartz, who was a trained art historian that worked and traveled across Europe, valued art education as a great and important virtue. His mission, in his own words, was to educate mankind for an artistic experience to enrich their lives. Already in Tel Aviv, he published a booklet in Hebrew titled Guide to Art Education, More Derech Leomanut, originally written in German under the title Wege zu Kunstzertium. The publication was addressed to both youngsters and adults, as he wrote in a very communicative language about the importance of being exposed to visual arts, to learn how to look at art and to pay attention to details such as compositions, colors, techniques, and materials. This publication resonates to Schwartz's work on the photographic collection, where he created a large repository of images which stand as a tool, an asset, that accompanies his theories on art education and pedagogy. In the collection, one could see documentation of various types of artworks, from quick pencil sketches and few originals by known Jewish artists Max Liebermann and Josef Israels, along with paintings by Berlin Jewish leading artists of the 1920s, Lesser Uri, Schwartz's close friends, depicting the city life in Berlin of the interwar period. The photographic collection, although defined as a Jewish collection, includes as well works by non-Jewish artists, especially works depicting biblical sin, for which Schwartz had a great appreciation. In the introduction to the publication, The Bible in Art, which was published in Tel Aviv in 1952, he writes, and I quote, the greatest revelation of artistic power glorifying the Bible in painting, sculpture, and graphic art are the immortal works of Michelangelo, Raphael, and Tintoretto, of Holbein and Rembrandt, including these reproductions of the old masters into the collection assisted to build its universal framework. For Schwartz, providing a historical background was not less important than promoting Jewish contemporary artists of his time. He worked on the collection in the same way he was writing, in a very communicative manner as he approached his reader in a simple language explaining thoroughly every professional terminology he used. The collection covered many different topics combining secular and profane and historical images together with contemporary ones. Within this construction, there was a suggestion or rather an invitation for the viewer to create their own association and build their own stories from the collection's materials. Its structure, of independent A3 sheets of cardboard with an image glued in the middle allowed to physically select fragments from the entire collection and present each time a different cluster of images. The selection could be thematic, chronological, according to a certain medium or technique or any other artistic or historical category. The collection was in fact, and still is a pedagogical performative asset in a constant development as although there are no new materials added to it, there are still untold possibilities for its arrangement. Schwartz wrote about the responsibility of the artist who creates work, leaving it for future generations. Yet he also reflected upon the roles of both the curator and the educator. For him, working on the collection was shaping the future. 
He was responsible for the ways future generation will be confronted with Jewish art and culture. Reading Schwartz's text about education and examining the methodologies he incorporated in his curatorial work, both in Berlin and in Tel Aviv, I could notice a strong reference to Martin Buber theories on education. In his text, Education, from the 1926, uh, which was part of his speech at the Third International Educational Conference in Heidelberg in August um, uh, 1925, uh, whose subject was the development of the creative powers in the child, Buber writes, and I quote, what we term education, conscious and willed, means a selection by men of the effective world. It means to give decisive effective power to a selection of the world, which is concentrated and manifested in the educator. The relation in education is lifted out of the purposelessly streaming education by all things, and is marked off as purpose. In this way, through the educator, the world for the first time becomes a true subject of its effect." End of quote. I would like to examine this paragraph in relation to the photographic collection and to Schwartz's pedagogical work. What Buber describes and for Schwartz exercises is the direction of the gaze of both the individual and the society. Schwartz recognizes the power he has and meticulously select visual examples which can penetrate the minds and hearts of many. Yet he does not coerce them. He placed these references at our front door and let us experience and explore them as we like. The connection and interconnections as well as the interpretation, including this very one I'm presenting today is fully ours. In short, the in an invitation to look is the essence of this educational process. Another important aspect of the photographic collection is its materiality. Although it, is it was recently digitized by the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw and could be explored in very high resolution from anywhere in the world, the quality of the collection lies as well within its materiality. I was very fortunate to look closely at the textured cardboards with prints and graphics glued to them Oftentimes one can recognize imprints of the image onto the other side of the cardboard due to chemical, the chemical reaction of the emulsion. In 1936, in a text about the graphic art, which was published in Hebrew uh, when Schwartz was already in Tel Aviv, he writes about the concept of illustration that became popular thanks to many illustrated newspapers and journals incorporating images into their printed editions. The printed image, he writes, became an important cultural factor. The great human inclination for information has been deploying all possible resources. Excellent machines that can disseminate information in great amounts were invented and brought prints, printed text and images into many homes. This fragment confirms Schwartz's interest and professional understanding of the graphic art. He embraced the new possibilities it offered already while working on the photographic collection in Berlin. In a way, it symbolizes the futuristic optimism of the 1920s in Germany, which suggested that creative work could become accessible and remain beyond the limits of our time. Reading Schwartz's words, one cannot avoid mentioning the canonical work of Walter Benjamin, the work of art in, in the age of mechanical reproduction that was published in 1935 exactly in the same time when the last fragments on the photographic collections were incorporated into it at, a, at the Jewish Museum in Berlin before the closing of the museum two years later. There are no chronicles or any encounter before, between Schwartz and Benjamin, yet it is highly possible they passed by each other on the streets of Berlin. I ask myself whether their approach towards the mechanical reproduction of artworks is derived from the same position. Benjamin politicized the process of the mechanical reproduction and appropriates it in order to draw upon different political tendencies in Europe at that time. While Schwartz maintains a more traditional approach of an art historian, he is emancipating graphic art by giving it an autonomy. It isn't merely an illustration, he writes in his text about graphic art. It aims to function as an independent artwork, subject to it its own rules. And he continues, 
Although created in, other, in order to reach many, many circles, it is a genre that could speak to the heart of an art expert. Although he admits that the printing machine lacks the sensitivity of the human hand, he summarized his text in a very expressive way. And I quote, every person who can understand the great value of graphic art could experience an artistic joy. And even a small print is a representative of the beauty and the sublime of the universe, end of quote. When examining um, different tendencies and research practices within the arts uh, in Germany of the late 20s, uh, 1920s, one should look at the work of art historian and culture theorist Abi Warburg, whose last project, Atlas Nemosine, a work in the form of a picture atlas of printed images from various fields such as art history, astrology, mythology, and archaeology, all pinned to 40 large black screens. The method of pinning photographs to a canvas allowed Warburg to rearrange the configurations of the images and each time create new connection and analogies within the world of images he created for himself that will help him to better understand the world at large. I find Atlas Nemozine an interesting example for, the, for a collection, an archive, a repository of images that lies within a, this thin border between a work of art and a cultural work about art. Babu, who also founded the Kunze, um, the Kulturwissenschaft Bibliothek Warburg in 1926 in Hamburg had an interdisciplinary approach towards art history. In the introduction to the Nemozine, he wrote, what we, and I, I quote, what we call the artistic act is really the exploration by the groping hand of the object, succeeded by plastic or pictorial fixation, equidistant from imaginary, ima imaginary grappling and conceptual contemplation. These are the two aspects of the image, one devoted to the fight against chaos because the work of art selects and clarifies the contours of the individual project, object, and other requiring the beholder to submit to the worship of the created idol that he sees." End of quote. The main research question that is leading my work on the photographic collection of the first Berlin Jewish Museum is related to my own artistic practice, which is rooted in archival and historical research. As an artist, I observed the photographic collection mm, in a similar way to Abi Warburg's Atlas. As a one repository composed of many autonomic elements, when joined together, they create novel interrelations. The mm, collection encapsulates both the craftsmanship of each print as well as the various narratives presented in its approximately 5,000 individual sheets. These narratives are the foundation of Central European Jewish culture from the 17th century until the late 1930s. Schwartz and his colleagues created a time capsule and using universal visual tools of artistic research, it can still exist in the realm of contemporary art even almost 100 years after its creation. Thank you.